Namibia, a hot, dry country in southern Africa. On the edge of the Namib, the oldest desert on Earth, the animals eke out a harsh existence. Water and food are scarce. Just one narrow strip of the coast is brimming with life, supported by the abundance of the ocean. A German biologist has chosen this country of contrasts for her research, and with good reason. Brown hyenas, which live here cheek by jowl with seals, have been the focus of her attention for years. What Ingrid Wiesel would like to know is, what ties the shaggy animals to the seals? A puzzle which can only be answered by following the trail of the brown hyena wherever it leads. first rays of the sun transform the sea into rippling gold, but on the Namib coast, the hours after dawn are bitterly cold. Only a few early birds, like flamingos, are already looking for food. But for the southern African fur seals, the day is only just beginning. They live in a densely crowded colony, leaving it to go hunting underwater in the fish-rich waters of the Atlantic. It's a barren shore, just water and rock for miles on end. Few animals can find a living in this wilderness, but brown hyenas have mastered it. Two females, known as Gypsy and her daughter Emma, are raising their young in the same den together. Living in an extended family makes sense. The mothers can share the work. A scientist's day starts early, so at least the cold nights are short. Ingrid Wiesel has lived in Namibia for five years. She has spent countless days and nights in this rather Spartan hut. Originally from Hamburg, Germany, she could only guess at the strains of field research when she began her studies for the Zoological Institute of her home university. She was to investigate the feeding ecology and hunting behavior of the brown hyena. No easy task in this inhospitable landscape, far from civilization. Ingrid Wiesel's work has already attracted the attention of international scientists. Last year, she was appointed as expert advisor to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Her hyena project is now part of a nationwide program organized by international scientists. A census of all the large predators of Namibia. For Ingrid, every day begins with the same routine, a walk through the seal colony. These animals play a very special part in the life of the brown hyenas. Southern African fur seals have lived on this beach for about 50 years. They occupied the islands offshore before then, but today they have spread to the coast. Every year in October, the huge animals come ashore in large numbers to mate and to give birth. There is constant warfare between the bulls for the best places. Only the strongest can gather a harem of females round themselves. Today, thousands upon thousands of animals live in Wolf Bay, a crucial study area in Ingrid Wiesel's work. Anyone who wants to learn about seals must get close to them. On all fours, at eye level, this causes the least annoyance to the powerful animals. The intruder means no harm, even when she takes a youngster from the middle of the colony for her research. The baby will be readily accepted again by its mother. Oh, 
It's mid-December, the height of summer in southern Africa, the time when most baby seals are born. Okay, just relax. Ingrid wants to find out everything about the youngsters, the numbers born, how their weight increases, their growth, and much more. You're such a nice one. Relax. This is the only way to establish a baseline for her detailed report on the development of the population and the future chances of the colony. Sadly, here in Namibia, as elsewhere, seals are still killed every year. Admittedly, this happens only in fixed seasons. But nevertheless, it's a serious matter. Until now, every effort to put a stop to it has failed. When full-grown bulls fight for mastery, it's a clash of titans. With slashing teeth, each tries to wound his opponent. As a result, the skin of veteran fighters is covered with scars. But the effort is worthwhile. Only the winner of many duels can pass his genes down to the next generation. Some duels end up literally all at sea. The seals are by no means a match for the power of the waves. All the same, water is their element. They glide playfully in the swirling waves of the cold Benguela current. This water from the Antarctic makes the ocean here in the tropics unusually cool. But it is rich in plant and animal life. It brings plenty of food for the seals, and it is the foundation of every form of life here on the edge of the Namib Desert. Without the food and the cold water brought by the Benguela Current, there would be no jackass penguins here. Most of their order live in the Antarctic. It's a surprise to find their elegant costumes so far to the north, on the edge of the Namib Desert. Cape Gannets, too, build their breeding colonies only where the sea provides fish in abundance, daily for thousands of hungry birds. The same goes for some other dedicated fishermen, Cape Cormorants, which also often gather by the thousand, and Crowned Cormorants, which build their nests among the seals. Those that can't hunt underwater find what they need at the edge of the sea. Every incoming wave deposits fresh food on the beach, from tiny microorganisms to dead fish. And nothing is wasted. There are plenty of takers. The most conspicuous customers at this inexhaustible store are birds, but they are not the only ones. Crabs, too, take their share. And from time to time, a very special beachcomber turns up, the strand wolf, the name given here on the coast to the brown hyena. Brown hyenas are mainly scavengers. On the edge of the Namib desert, they couldn't survive unless they made use of anything and everything edible. Ingrid Wiesel knows about the habits of brown hyenas. She has tried to follow them many times, mostly without success. But one day her stamina paid off, and Gypsy led Ingrid to her den in a dry, rocky landscape two kilometers from the sea. For some time, Gypsy has shared this den with her daughter Emma, a hyena with a conspicuous ear notch. Ingrid Wiesel and Emma go back a long way. She was the first brown hyena she met nearly five years ago. She can follow Emma's routine almost continuously with the help of a radio collar. No other hyena is so close to her heart.
Whenever Ingrid hears the signal that Emma transmits, she tries to find her. But the signals indicate only the direction, not the distance. It always takes a certain amount of luck to actually find a brown hyena in this endless brown scenery. But, like all brown hyenas, Emma has some habits which make her easier to find. She has favorite roots which she uses all the time while looking for food. For Ingrid Wiesel, checking these paths has been routine for a long time. She keeps a lookout for Emma from certain observation points, and from time to time, she gets lucky. A jackal on the horizon is a good sign. And then, close by, she finds Emma. Emma has found something to eat, the remains of an old bone. But she has to fight even for that. Jackals are cunning. They seem to know when and where there is something to steal, and they have little respect for hyenas. They are also very nimble and agile. The little thief can always dodge Emma's attacks. For Ingrid Wiesel, today's search for Emma has been well worthwhile. Encounters between jackal and hyena are by no means an everyday sight in the Namib. At first glance, a lizard doesn't look like a predator. But like hyenas and jackals, the biggest part of its diet consists of animal protein. An abrupt end for the grasshopper larva, which stood no chance of escaping the clutches of what is literally a cold-blooded killer. The following days see the usual routine. Gypsy appears regularly at the den. Brown hyenas are by no means active only at night. If they feel safe, they also go out in broad daylight. This is the fourth day when Ingrid Wiesel sees only Gypsy with the young. It often happens that one of the mothers is away for a while, but this time Ingrid feels uneasy. Could Emma be in some kind of trouble? Not just two, but three pups jostle around Gypsy. They all want to drink at the same time, whether she is their own mother or not. Who belongs to whom is no secret to Ingrid. Gypsy discourages the larger pups with her teeth. The smallest is her own. Generally, brown hyenas are good foster mothers. Rearing their offspring in common has its advantages. Freedom of movement for the mothers, for one. Gypsy also provides reliably for her daughter's pups. But the young hooligans are not allowed to drive her own baby away. It takes time until it becomes clear who has precedence. At last, after all the squabbling, the little one has its mother to itself, and it can now drink in peace as much as it likes. Its older companions, meanwhile, engage in some combat training of their own. At their present age, the larger cubs do not depend solely on milk. Perhaps this is why Emma, their mother, doesn't visit the den so often now. Gypsy, on the other hand, still shows a great deal of motherly concern for her baby, just a few weeks old. But this affection can be irksome to the little one, especially when the older members of its clan turn the entrance to the den into a playground.
by human children playing. In the young hyena's games, the smallest is often allowed to win. Gypsy has been watching over the cubs from the den. Now, in the last of the evening light, she goes off herself to look for food. The young spend the next hours alone in the safety of the burrow. Gypsy will cover 20 or 30 kilometers effortlessly with the typical hyena lope until she has found something to satisfy her hunger. Meanwhile, the seal colony in Wolf Bay is full to overflowing. Like most of their relations, Southern African fur seals feel at ease only in dense crowds. They lie packed together all over the rocky shore. Harem bulls have gathered their females and are flirting with them in their own way. In these cramped conditions, to go to the water means running the gauntlet, as each seal defends its own resting place. Now is the time when most of the females give birth, almost simultaneously. As with all colonial animals, they have no privacy at all. Wherever the contractions start, the mother squeezes her pitch black baby into the daylight, which looks as if it had been wrapped in cellophane. Kelb gulls are not after the babies, but the afterbirths. They fight fiercely over them, often right next to the mothers, busy with their newborn babies. For the gulls, it is a time of plenty. For them, Wolf Bay is a land of milk and honey, albeit for only a few weeks. But the birds must look out for the mother seal's sharp teeth. No one is allowed to come too close to their babies. Tender loving care stops when the mothers become rivals. Probably one of the two has lost her pup. She now brutally demands the neighbor's baby in its place. The quarrel ends only when the enormous harem bull appears and gradually calms down the combatants. <laughs> Miraculously, the baby has survived the wicked stepmother's violent tug of war unharmed. But now it needs a break and refreshment. During their short time on shore, the seals not only give birth, the females are ready to mate soon after their young are born. The males, four times the weight of their mates, look as if they'll crush them in the process. Like the gulls, jackals also benefit from the colony. For them too, there is always something worth having, even if the watchful mothers will not let them come near. Like Emma the hyena, this jackal is in the service of science. Although its collar does not send out signals, the red color identifies it clearly. The jackal doesn't mind the collar. He has set his sights on other things. Along with the larger predators in Namibia, jackals are included in an international project to investigate their distribution and population. It is the only way to measure the threats to these animals. Now, in the seal's breeding season, jackals, like gulls, live a life of plenty.
and some others also benefit. Baby seals that wander away from the center of the colony are in great danger. They know no enemies, and in their innocence, when they are not being looked after by their mothers, they often walk straight into them. Observations like this are great moments for every field researcher. Who would have thought that brown hyenas would not only collect carrion, but also actively hunt like their relatives, the spotted hyenas? Considering that the seal colony has only been in Wolf Bay for 50 years, this behavioral adaptation of the hyenas has, in evolutionary terms, happened amazingly fast. Ingrid Wiesel is increasingly worried. Emma has still not shown up at the clan's den. Ingrid decides to travel to Luderitz to make inquiries. For a couple of days, she will leave Wolf Bay. Her workplace lies in the so-called Forbidden Zone, a closely protected area where no one may go without a permit, not even the hyena lady. Not even allowed to drive her own car through the checkerboard. Very nice. Thank That's you. That's up to the warden. Meanwhile, Ingrid must submit to a body search. The Forbidden Zone is a diamond mining area, and these strict protection measures are necessary to forestall the greed aroused by these shiny pebbles. It is amazing what people will come up with to okay, smuggle diamonds out of the protected okay, area. No, Stones have been stuck to carrier oh, pigeons, nice hidden so in the nice soles of shoes, even fired nice over the boundary with a bow cool, and arrow. Thanks, Ingrid Wiesel takes the security procedures in good stride. Diamonds have no part in her life. Her only concern now is the missing Emma. As part of her research program, she has left questionnaires in Luteritz for tourists, mine workers, and townspeople to write down their observations of hyenas. It is an important basis for her population studies. The reports are collected in the office of the mining company. It's a faint hope, but perhaps someone has seen Emma. Are you? Yeah, good, cool. Everything's all right. I heard somebody dropped a hyena form for me here. Luderitz is just a village. Everyone knows the hyena lady. Everybody knows about the project and happily passes on their observations to her. Ingrid Wiesel owes much important information to this active cooperation by the public. Brown hyenas are easy to identify and can hardly be confused with any other animal. We'll see later. No, great. Thank you very much. See you later. So Ingrid can trust the reports that she receives. A little office in town is where she does her desk work. Here, all the data can be processed with modern technology. Today's questionnaire comes from a mine worker who has seen a hyena with a collar feeding on carrion in Elizabeth Bay. Perhaps this was Emma. The information is only a day old. Ingrid Wiesel will go to Elizabeth Bay first thing in the morning to try to find the hyena. Not everyone is in for a good night's sleep. At the hyena den, there is a lot going on. Instead of human footprints, these days hyena tracks are leading into the ghost town of Elizabeth Bay. Unlike a hundred years ago, when the diamond rush was on and the town throbbing with life. Ruins are all that remain of the splendor that once was. For 
Ingrid Wiesel, today's program is set. She will search from house to house, looking carefully for the fresh remains of a hyena's meal, and perhaps to find a clue to Emma's presence in the ghost town. Brown hyenas love the rocky maze left behind by people. They leave their traces everywhere, including bits of bone, the skin of a seal, and footprints. On a hot summer's day like today, the animals prefer to creep into the underground passages of an abandoned factory. In the gloom of this cool underworld, they have resting places where they spend the heat of the day. Even though Ingrid Wiesel knows every nook and cranny here from countless visits, the passages are still somewhat eerie. It's only with great caution that she ventures into these tumble-down buildings. In the dark cellars, her every step is apprehensive. But there is no movement, not even a fleeting shadow. Wherever she looks, there is no sign of the missing hyena. Only the usual stale food scraps everywhere, showing clearly how often hyenas come and go. But there's no sign that Emma was among them. Gypsy's den, meanwhile, is the scene of a rare encounter. An unknown visitor suddenly appears on the rocky ridge. Gypsy is not there, and her pup immediately practices twig marking, leaving a scent mark as hyenas do. This is not at all easy, but practice makes perfect. For all its excitement, the pup has not noticed the large stranger. As soon as it has finished its task, it hurries back into the safety of the den. One thing is immediately clear. This hyena does not belong to the gypsy clan. The stranger is seeing the den and its surroundings for the first time. He places scent marks on stones and twigs to let every other hyena know he was here. But who can he be? Possibly a nomadic male with no strong attachment to any clan. A jackal eagerly follows the stranger's every movement. Maybe he's hidden some food his shadower might nick on the sly. Obviously, the hyena is only interested in the scent coming from inside the clan den. Suddenly, sand and stones are flying everywhere. Perhaps he wants to widen the entrance to get at the pups. Although infanticide, which is quite normal among lions, has never been observed among brown hyenas. But the young don't know this. They keep out of sight, and the stranger unearths something else. With only a few meager scraps, he finally slinks away. The jackal takes nothing. The stranger won't share. There's no fresh water here where desert, rock, and sea meet. Only the gathering mist supplies the precious moisture that finds its way into the interior day for day. with its mass of cold water, not only provides a wealth of food along the coast, but also a daily bank of fog. The drift of moist air allows for a frugal life in the world of sand dunes that stretches a hundred kilometers inland.
here there are accessible water holes, the key to life for a fascinating array of large African mammals. Most of them simply could not subsist around Wolf Bay. Elephants, for example, must find a water hole regularly to fill up with around 200 liters. Lions, too, can only survive if they can drink regularly. And many of their prey animals, like these coolies, would have no chance by the sea without fresh water. They have learned to live alongside the deadly hunters. They know exactly when their predators are coming to the water hole just to drink. If they were hunting, they wouldn't approach so openly. What brings them here now is thirst, plain and simple. When it comes to slurping up water, a lion's tongue is nothing like an elephant's trunk. It takes a long time for the big cat to slake its thirst. In late afternoon, a hyena troop appears at the water hole. As a clan, they feel confident, even with lions around. But they would rather move on to enjoy a drink in peace. Conflict can be dangerous, as well as a waste of energy. Unlike their relations on the coast, spotted hyenas depend completely on fresh water. They couldn't survive in the brown hyena's arid home. Gradually, the whole clan arrives. In the heat of late afternoon, they need the water not only for drinking, but for keeping cool. Though there is not much water here behind the hills, it makes a big difference. A huge number of animals can live here. The bat-eared fox has found its niche, digging in the sand for ants and termites. With its enormous ears, it can easily hear the sounds the insects make as they move about underground. Suricates, too, are at home in this landscape, little predators with needle-like teeth. For them, fighting is the order of the day, but they must take care in the excitement not to overlook their large, spotted neighbor. But the leopard has already found its prey. A steenbok was not careful enough and has paid with its life for what might have been only a small error. To avoid possible competitors, the hunter quickly brings its prey to safety. insurmountable obstacle. Only brown hyenas can live beyond the dunes. For them, the mountains of sand are no barrier. But how do they solve the water problem? After all, they can't drink from the sea. What Ingrid observes here and can prove for the first time with solid evidence is a specialized piece of predatory behavior. It represents another step in the development of the brown hyena from being a scavenger to becoming an active hunter. 
When they kill a seal pup, brown hyenas feed selectively on its brain, which contains a lot of liquid. Often this is the only part of their prey that they take, leaving all the rest uneaten. To our eyes, this might seem gruesome. For the brown hyenas, it is a successful strategy, which saves them from dying of thirst. Thus, at least during the summer, it is the young seals that guarantee the survival of brown hyenas on the coast of the Namib Desert. Thirst is not a problem for seal babies. They are supplied with milk by their mothers. The kelp gulls, on the other hand, must take care how they quench their thirst. They get liquid from their food. They even have the cheek to snatch a seal's food from under its nose when it services to chop up a fish it has caught. everything is proceeding as usual. Most of the young are growing quickly on their mother's nourishing milk, and they are very active. But they can also become victims. Ingrid finds many dead baby seals which are outwardly completely undamaged, but prove to have had their skulls crushed. She suddenly realizes what is happening. Some other predators behave like this too, Scientists call it surplus killing. Day by day, Ingrid collects the dead animals and, as usual, notes all the relevant scientific data. As if in a frenzy, brown hyenas kill far more baby seals than they need. For predators, this is not unfamiliar behavior. For Ingrid's research, the discovery of surplus killing is another important observation that proves conclusively that the behavior of brown hyenas is changing, from scavenging to predation. Finally, Ingrid attaches a small plastic marker, which if it turns up again later, will tell where the carcass has ended up. On her way back from the colony, Ingrid receives a call. Hello? Yes? Someone has found okay. a dead hyena, run over is by a car. Dead? It is still on the okay, side of the road killed? with two boys waiting sure. beside it. Okay. Two boys, you say? Okay, There's no hesitating now. Yeah. She must go to the scene immediately. Um, are they still there? Such quick action is okay, part of her everyday life. I'll, I'll to keep a check on the hyena population in her study her. area, wait, she must so take so notice so of every questions. incident. But there is okay, another reason so for her haste. For information. I'll leave just now. Thank you. Bye. A nagging question preys on her mind. Could the dead animal be one that she knows? Perhaps even the missing Emma? The two boys were on their way into town when they found the hyena. No, they didn't see the car that caused the accident. With great relief, Ingrid recognizes at once that this is not Emma. The dead animal is not wearing a radio collar. It has no notch in its ear. And it is a male. What follows is established routine. She makes a quick note of all the important details. Where found, time of day, cause of death, sex. Any further investigation can be done later in the laboratory. An exact comparison with all the data stored in the computer might perhaps provide information about the animal's origin. Can you do me a favor and just hold the teeth, the mouth open, so that I can take a photo of the teeth? She also photographs the teeth. 
This will provide useful information about the animal's age and state of health. Okay, thank you. I know now it's disgusting. The boys help her lift the heavy animal into the car. It must be taken as quickly as possible to Luteritz as the midday heat accelerates decomposure. Traffic accidents actually aren't common causes for the deaths of hyenas, but once in a while, they do happen. There is no reward for the boys, and they don't expect one either. They have met the hyena lady many times and know about her research program. Even though they don't really understand what brings the young woman here, let alone her boundless enthusiasm for the shaggy hyenas, they respect Ingrid Wiesel and will help her in any way they can. While Ingrid Wiesel works far into the night in a laboratory in Lutowitz, a strange thing is happening in front of the hyena clan's den out among the rocks. In the last light of the day, a hyena slinks secretively back to the den. The collar and the notched ear are plain to see. It is the long lost Emma. She has come home. At first, the two large pups engrossed in their play have no eyes for the homecomer. Then they suddenly notice that this time it is their very own mother. They give her a warm welcome. This time, it's Gypsy's pup that doesn't get a look in or even looked at. Emma takes her two youngsters with her and leads them away from what was the clan's shared den. Gypsy's baby stays behind, its playmates gone, following their mother, no one knows where, into the deepening night. On her daily visits to the hyena den, Ingrid Wiesel notices that the two large pups have disappeared. This is a really good sign. Ingrid hopes that Emma has taken them away and is now looking after them. But she cannot be sure until she has actually seen mother and pups together. Even with radio telemetry, in the unending vastness of the Namib, finding one specific hyena is like looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack. But her efforts and her patience pay off in the end. Suddenly, Emma's distinctive signal can be heard loud and clear. On a hilltop, silhouetted against the sky, Ingrid discovers her very own Emma together with her young. In a great wave of relief, all the worries and tension of the previous weeks immediately fall away. For hyenas, moving to a new home is not unusual. After two or three months, a clan den is usually uninhabitable. It becomes infested with parasites, which attach themselves to the pup's fur, making their life a misery. Then, moving on is the only thing to do. But there was certainly no agreement between Gypsy and Emma about the exact time to move. Family bonds in hyena clans hardly go that far. But it's not impossible that the two of them will ever find themselves together again. It is the end of February. Down on the beach, Ndako Mukapuli has taken up his daily observation post. Like Ingrid Wiesel, he has been working for some time in the Forbidden Zone. The main focus of his research are the seals. 
Ingrid keeps in good contact with her scientific neighbor because his results complement her own researches in the seal colony. Her work on the behavior of the brown hyenas is not yet finished. In particular, their relations with and possible influence on the seal population. The southern African summer is drawn to a close. The young seals have grown bigger, too big for predators, which still raid the colony as before, but now seldom find anything to eat. The baby phases have become adult, and like adults, they stand for no nonsense. More and more often, the raiders in the colony now leave as they arrived with empty bellies. For Ingrid Wiesel, too, the end of summer brings changes. Her daily work in the seal colony is largely finished. From now on, the hyenas will live through harder times. They must revert to beachcombing, gathering whatever the sea provides, living mostly on carrion. They will become active hunters again only when the next breeding season brings the seals ashore. How the family groups will develop in future remains the main question on Ingrid Wiesel's mind. Her fascination with these extraordinary animals just keeps on growing. Gypsy is alone with her pup. She is now its only playmate. Perhaps the future will bring new partnerships. Or perhaps she will go back to the familiar and dependable life with her daughter Emma and her grandchildren.